The popularity of his marches led to the creation of the two-step with two steps to the beat. From Harper's Weekly, published in December 22nd, 1896. The two-step is a change from the waltz, easier, lively, and offering more opportunity for fun and jollity. And now, a two-step to Sousa's King Cotton March, 1895. The latest popular dance music was normally obtained via sheet music. This is a dance called Everybody's Doing It by Irving Berlin, published in 1911. In 1877, Thomas Alva Edison invented a machine that could record the human voice on wax cylinders. Ten years later, he formed the Edison Phonograph Company to sell cylinder phonographs to play recorded music. In 1912, he improved the sound quality by making them of celluloid. He trademarked them blue ambrel records and sold them in cardboard canisters. Sousa was the first person to call it canned music and was totally opposed to such music. He feared that people would depend on recorded music and learning musical instruments or even singing would become a thing of the past. Ironically, here is a cylinder recording of Sousa's Liberty Bell March. And if any of you are Monty Python fans, this was their opening theme tune every week. We love this one. 
In 1887, Emil Berliner invented the gramophone record, which eventually replaced cylinders. And today, of course, we have the CDs, and if you're really with it, iPods. At the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, Scott Joplin, an African-American from Sedalia, Missouri, played ragtime music for the visitors. He composed hundreds of ragtime pieces of dance music, and he actually composed two operas, which are not very well known. But the one that still survives is called Tremonisha. And fortunately, the Houston Opera Company performed it 20 years ago, and it's still on video. It's beautiful. You really need to watch it. It's just a gorgeous piece of music. Now, the dance that we're about to do is called The One Step. And it was created for ragtime music, and it often has animal variations. Now, sometimes these animal variations don't really look like the animal. So we want to um, explain what the animal is before we do the dance. So, Jeff? The first animal that we're going to demonstrate really isn't an animal. It's actually a crab, and it looks like this. And we're going to go sideways and show you what it looks like. And. So that was the crab. Nancy will now tell you how we're going to do the kangaroo. OK. So kangaroos characteristically hop. So the kangaroo variation hops as well. The next variation isn't really an animal, but it's a way of uh, changing corners in the room, and it's called the Yale position. And it looks something like this. We have the turkey trot. The next animal is actually a real animal. It's called the squirrel, and it looks like this. You know, we do a lot of work with children in the schools, and when we tell them that this particular dance is actually done by adults, they don't actually believe us. They think these dances are actually for them. Our next animal is not actually an animal, it's an insect, and it's a flea. And fleas hop on animals, so this dance also hops. The last one we're going to do, for this one, you better make sure that your deodorant is working very, very well, because we're going to get up close and personal. It's called the bunny hug. Okay. 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 okay, the last animal we're going to show is called the ostrich stomp. And you have to imagine an ostrich that has been frightened, so we flap our tail feathers, and or we flap our wings, and we run around in circles. We make an ostrich head, we bury our head in the sand, and we wiggle our tail feathers. <laughs> and that's the ostrich stomp. Now, we're going to put that dance together. It's called the one step, but there, there is a surprise animal at the ending. And we'd like you to try and guess what it is, the one step.
Did you guess that that was a bear? Yes. It's actually called the grizzly bear, and there are hundreds of animals. Some of them don't look very much like animals, and of course, as you saw, some of them were actually insects. We're going to move forward now from that kind of dance to probably the most romantic dance in the entire world, and I think you know what's coming. The tango was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The city was home to thousands of poor immigrants, especially from Italy, Spain, Africa, and Germany, which gave it its characteristic instrument called a bandoneon. Modern research shows it developed in the lower class dance halls of poor neighborhoods and not in houses of ill repute, as was previously thought. Buenos Aires high society considered it immoral and indecent, but their rich playboy sons learned it just the same. Every year, these playboys went to Paris for the season, where they taught it to their high society Parisian friends. Paris was named, nicknamed Tangoville by the newspapers, with 1913 known as the Year of Tangomania. The dance then spread throughout Europe and the USA, and by April 1914, had reached the remote town of Fairbanks, Alaska. In 1913, Rudolf Valentino, an 18-year-old Italian immigrant, arrived in New York City. Very poor, he took jobs, odd jobs, often sleeping on park benches. After a friend taught him the tango, his life changed forever. As a taxi dancer, French word gigolo, he was paid money by women to dance with him. Described as pirate tango style, he held his partner very close, arms straight out, cheek to cheek, sometimes bending them backwards very low. He was discovered by Joan Sawyer, a professional ballroom dancer, who he partnered on the vaudeville circuit, and after several years he went to Hollywood and his first major movie. We will now dance for you a ragtime tango in honor of Rudolph Valentino. 